have no regards or respect for refs, and I think they all should be exterminated. What is American gangster about? They're them American refs. Rayful and Alpo and Nicky Balls and Sammy Bull. Man, them refs. about to see the first part of our series may be disturbing. If the kids are still awake, discretion is advised. Rafael Edmund, who was once called the biggest drug dealer in Washington, D.C. I don't think anybody has ever monopolized the drug trade to that extent before or after Rafael. You turn the tremendous intellect and leadership skills into building a criminal organization, the likes of which the Washington, D.C. had never seen. I remember when he first met Melvin Butler, you know what I mean? You could tell they was on some gang shit. Prosecutors say Butler was Edmund's West Coast cocaine connection. Me and him took a trip to L.A. And when we when we got to L.A., Melvin gave us like 50000 uh, So Ray, he basically gave me about 20000 So we was out there for about a week. But when Mel when I come to D.C. We got the California dudes down here. Me, Melvin, Whitey. I mean, our whole little crew, we go be like three cars deep. So listening to Bootsy, the defendant's own mother, who was also convicted co-conspirator, talk to Alter Ray Zanfil about Rafael Edmund and how he got started in the drug business and how he got so huge in the drug business has got to be devastating. Edmund's unsuspecting mother talked at a local restaurant with a friend, a friend who had agreed to wear a wire for the prosecution. You know, like he was doing hand-to-hand -hand coming, him and Johnny, on the corner, and they were selling, so they were getting it all right. And then, he just, it just got to be, he just started, went out on his own. According to police, Edmund was so powerful and so dangerous, the jury in his trial had to sit behind bulletproof glass, their identities hidden from the public for their own safety. They had an anonymous jury panel so that the jurors' names and addresses weren't uh, put on the jury list as they do in any other trial. They weren't scared of the judge, you know, because he was real polite, you know, showed him a lot of respect and let him know he appreciated him sitting there as jurors, you know, through this long trial. And they weren't scared of the prosecutors because they weren't on trial, they were just doing their job, they was at work every day. So the only person in the courtroom to be scared of, they weren't scared of defense attorneys because they was doing their job every day. Only people in the courtroom to be scared of or think all this is for can be the defendants. The jury found Edmund guilty of a massive drug conspiracy and sentenced him to life without parole. I always knew throughout the whole trial that we was going to get found guilty. Verdict today in the Edmund drug ring trial in Washington, 24-year-old Rayful Edmund convicted of running a $2 million a week cocaine crime outfit in the nation's capital. The one-time schoolyard basketball star faces a mandatory life sentence now. Ten co-defendants, including friends and relatives, were found guilty on related charges. Security surrounding the trial was unusually tight. Names of the jurors were kept secret even from the judge and lawyers to guard against possible reprisals. I got a tip from an informant that Rafel was setting up deals from the prison at Lewisburg. Edmund's drug activities while incarcerated surpassed in volume <coughs> and in scope the drug distribution network that he developed and ran prior to his imprisonment. Communication between the capitals of Colombia, one of the drug producing centers of the world, and the United States, one of the drug consuming centers of the world, exists on two levels. Cellmate at USP Lewisburg was the third largest cocaine dealer in the world. Chicky Osvaldo Trujillo Blanco. One of the sons of uh, Griselda Blanco, who was one of the original founders of the Medellin Cartel. He's sitting on top of a family empire in Colombia manufacturing cocaine. Rafel knew when he was back on the street, he made all these connections. 
played the tapes for him with his voice setting up drug deals. You money already? Uh, you need money? We had the undercover officer there that you could meet and see who we'd actually been had, uh, arranged for drugs with. Yeah, he really, the evidence we had against him, how long we'd been uh, investigating him. I have no problem using snitches. You, ha you have to, to prove the cases under our, our system of, of laws. He told us that he'd been thinking about this for a very long time. He'd already made a decision that when they stepped to him, he was going to cooperate. We arranged for him to call uh, us to collect at an undercover apartment, and then instead of his friends and family three-way in phone calls, we would three-way the phone call for him. You beep your source, he gets back to you on the number, you make your arrangements, and it's normally by public telephones, which make interception by electronic surveillance. Okay, that's how we set it up. They will call me and I will call back. We were very surprised that Rafel was hoping for this. Well, right now, it's kind of sad. Um, when I'm in jail most of the time, I'm separated from everybody. You know, they keep me locked down. I don't like that. I'd rather be just a you know ordinary prisoner. I don't want to be looked at like I'm different than any other human being that's in jail. I'm just like them. I'm in jail right now. What about your mother? My mother? Your mother on tape talking about you. I don't know if she was talking about me or who she was talking about. In the war on drugs, one of the most important weapons the government uses is the informant. With mandatory minimum penalties now for drug offenses, the pressure is on to name names. But with so much at stake, can an informant be trusted to be telling the truth? By the early 90s, the government was paying informants or snitches more than $100 million a year. They paid thousands of others by reducing their sentences. Over the last five years, nearly a third of the people sentenced in drug trafficking cases in the federal system had their sentences reduced because they informed on other people. The mandatory minimum laws left only one way for defendants to escape the full force of the sentence, to provide the government with what the prosecution would deem substantial assistance. In other words, to inform on someone else. It is an issue which is now hotly debated. If I offered a witness a hundred dollar bill to come down and say it my way, I'd go to prison for that. But yet the government can give them something far more precious than money, far more precious than diamonds or gold or anything. They can give them freedom. There are a lot of prosecutors who don't feel good about what they're doing. There are prosecutors who say, I didn't want this person to go to prison for such a long time, but it's my job. There are a lot of judges who've said on record, I did not want to give that person 10, 20, 30 years in prison, but it's my job. So if it's a part of your job, you have to do a good job. You have to put as many people in prison as you can. We're beginning to become a society of informants. You ever wake up in the middle of the night and say, I'm 25 years old, mm -hmm. and they tell me I'm going to have to spend the rest of my life Nah, I don't ever wake up and say that because I don't believe it. I don't, I don't believe that I'm going to spend the rest of my life in jail because I don't think that was meant for me to spend the rest of my life in jail. So I just don't look at it like that. I honestly don't believe it. I never even thought about it far as just knowing I'm going to be there even 10 or 15 years. I just know some, something is going to happen good and I'm going to eventually get out. Then I'm going to eventually get out. I'm going to eventually get out. He walked confidently toward the police helicopter, turned and mouthed these words. Look closely. Rafael Edmond said, I'll be back. For safety, we're not showing the face of the man that members of Rafael Edmond's cocaine empire knew as Jimmy. I was in there for like three days and got asked, did I want to do uh, undercover work? He was 26 when he began living undercover as a cocaine dealer. Unarmed and using only his wits, he worked his way close to the top of the cocaine wholesale operation that is estimated to have netted Rafael Edmond Jr. a million dollars a day in the mid to late 1980s. 30 murders were tied to the operation. You knew it was an organization that enforced discipline with murder? Yes. He remembers shipments of cocaine delivered by the truckload. And a guy sitting on the back with a Uzi 
with two Uzis. Then there's the legendary story about Georgetown basketball coach John Thompson's face-to-face -face confrontation with Edmund. The coach told the basketball-loving drug kingpin, who reportedly offered as much as $50,000 to some Hoyas players to be on his playground team, to leave them alone. Rafel respected that because Rafel was a big basketball fan. The 1989 bust of the Rafel Edmund Drug Organization resulted in charges against almost two dozen people. The sandstorm of cocaine that covered the nation's capital in misery and bloodshed would slowly, slowly start to recede. Jimmy says his only regret is that many who worked so hard to bring D.C.'s drug kingpin to justice were never fully recognized for their work. Group 32 from DEA MPD Task Force that always had my back on the street and always watched me. And I'd do it again. After he went to prison, he sold even more. Right here behind the concrete walls, steel bars, and locked doors of this maximum security federal penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Following his conviction as a drug kingpin, Edmund was sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole. But within just days of his arrival, he was back in business. He was dealing drugs right from his prison cell. Just about everybody inside the jail in some way, shape, form, or fashion is dealing in drugs, either directly or indirectly. He was caught and two years ago struck a deal with the feds. Ever since, he's been telling them exactly how he pulled it off. Tell me what drugs you dealt with in prison. Cocaine? Cocaine. Crack? Crack. Heroin? Heroin. What else? Marijuana. Those, those were the basic four. Cocaine, crack, and heroin. And marijuana. There's nothing left. <laughs> you did the gamut. Yeah, I did it all. He did it all, and then some. For starters, he brought drugs into the prison through this visiting room. He hired other inmates whose girlfriends, during contact visits, would pass the stuff packed in small balloons. She might kiss him, and he put them in his mouth. He, he drank swallowed. a little bit of soda or water, swallow them. She go do it again. Good he's day. got them all inside. Got them all inside. Then when he get back inside the institution, he, he spit them up. What's the most you ever heard? of those that any one person that I've seen one person bring I've yeah. seen somebody bring in like 60 of them Edmund says prison officials know this goes on it keeps the jail mellow it's keep people patient you know they be able to get high and chill so so they so they like this and let these things happen sometimes come on yeah that's what they do he wasn't just selling drugs to other prisoners he also masterminded the shipment of more than two tons of cocaine and crack from the coca fields of Columbia to the District of Columbia. In some ways, he's like the Babe Ruth of crack dealers. Eric Holder, the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, was, until recently, the top prosecutor in Washington, D.C. It was his office that locked Edmund up in the first place. Tell us the magnitude of his operation from inside the prison. If you look at it on a monthly basis, he was exceeding that which he did when he was running what, to that time, had been the largest drug operation in Washington, D.C. history. He was doing more from in prison? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. At the maximum, at its maximum, he was doing about 400 kilograms of uh, cocaine per month while in prison and while on the street. He was doing about 300 at its maximum. Edmund says it was easy to do from behind bars. Um, I think it's much easier than when you're on the street. Because easier than on the street? Much easier because you're right there with the people that have direct access to the narcotics that you need. Colombians, Cubans, Mexicans. All thrown in together. All thrown in together. Thrown in with criminals like Osvaldo Trujillo Blanco, or as Edmund knew him, Chicky, a convicted drug felon. He had a high profile case. I had a high profile case. So, you know, we were just wanting somebody to introduce us. We, we just was waiting for a person to come along and say, this Chicky, Chicky, this Ray. And we yeah. just gonna go from there. It was right there. What, what else? You know, what else? What else could we do? It's, it's right there. Chicky is cocaine royalty, son of Griselda Trujillo Blanco, better known as the godmother of the Colombian drug underworld, and a founding member of the notorious Medellin drug cartel. Does it make any sense to put the biggest guy from D.C. and someone from one of the largest cartels in Colombia? in such close proximity, you'd know it would be inevitable if they'd come together. No, I'm not sure that's true. I wouldn't make that assumption. I would think that both people, having been put in federal prison, um, would have been incapacitated. But they weren't. A year after Edmund met him, Chickie was released, 
and returned to his horse ranch in Columbia. And that's when business really took off. So how did you pull it off? I mean, you, you were doing pretty serious and impressive deals. Oh, yeah, from inside, Ma I love maximum security yeah, penitentiary. Maximum security. Specifically, how did you do it? Um, specifically, we would use the visiting room, the telephones. Specifically, these telephones, conveniently located just down the hall from his cell. Edmund would contact Chickie simply by placing a collect call to a friend in Washington. Every one of those calls was recorded. Hello, this is the AT&T operator with a collect call. Who's calling, please? Right. Will you accept the charge? Uh-huh. The friend, in turn, connected him to Chicky all the way down in Medellin. What reason would I be calling out the country? I'm not from Colombia or South yeah. America. Or here's a, like here's an inmate that's calling Medellin three and four times, times a, a week. week. So you know I'm up to something. <laughs> just just common sense would tell you. If you got good common sense, they would tell you that I'm up to no good. In one afternoon, right. he made 59 phone calls to five states and two foreign countries. I thought that we listened in on their phone conversations. I thought that when a guy makes a phone call, that, that the prison kind of knows what he's talking about. All the phone conversations, all the social phone conversations are recorded, but not all of them are monitored. Now, does that make any sense? Well, it doesn't make any sense except for the fact that they don't have the ability to. There's, there's simply not enough people to listen in on all of the phone conversations that all of these prisoners have. And the prisoners know that. They count on it. Well, I'm sure that's true. But Edmund says he and Chicky weren't taking any chances. They spoke in code. Remember, he used to live in 18th Street. Yeah. That he was going to move to downtown to 16th Street. To yeah. When, when, he, when he made that statement to me, he was letting me know that the price went down 3000 went from 19th Street to 16th Street. So automatically knew what he was talking about. Edmund used an entirely different code when he spoke to his distributors back in Washington, D.C. Believe it or not, he used Pig Latin. You want to hear a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I want to hear what you say. Article, what it could say, the Connecticut Utica, to do the Connecticut for the comedian. What did you say? Oh, I was just saying, I feel good today. So fast. You could yeah. do that. You, you got to just... be fast so that somebody, so nobody will understand what you're talking about. Yeah, and you could just do this whole interview like that? Yeah, I could do the whole interview like that. Now, but what kind of money were you making out of this? I wasn't making the money that I should be making, but, you know, I was getting 5000 here, 10000 there, which is, which is good money for somebody that's in jail and doing time. It was good money for anyone. $200,000 in two years collected for him by associates on the outside. But the money flow was disrupted when Chicky was gunned down in a Medellin nightclub, but only temporarily, because Edmund quickly struck up with another inmate, this time from the Cali cartel. Freddy Aguilera was serving 60 years with no parole, just a cell block away. And you hook up with another Colombian. Yeah. Like I told you, the temptation, you know, you got people every day, different people coming to me trying to hook up drug deals, and this is something that I can do and I know how to do. So it was just hard to say, no, I don't want to be involved in it when I can just say, okay, let me set this deal up and give me a quick twenty or $30,000. Prison authorities never did figure out what Edmund was up to. But the FBI and local police here in Washington, D.C. did, thanks to a tip from a jailhouse informant. When the feds went to Edmund with the evidence, much to their surprise, he agreed to cooperate. With his help, the government was able to lock up 15 drug dealers, among them some of the most violent drug thugs in the nation's capital. Why did you decide to cooperate? Because I wanted to, I wanted to put it all behind me. I wanted to, also, I wanted to help my family, first of all. That was, that was the first thing that gave me the motivation. My mom, my aunt, and my three sisters. His mom, his sisters, brothers, brothers-in-law, and others were all in the family business with Edmund and are all serving time. His mother and sisters are together at the Alderson Prison Camp in West Virginia. The feds told Edmund they would not recommend a sentence reduction for him. But they agreed to go to bat for his 56-year-old mother, who was sentenced to 24 years in prison for her role in Rafel's drug enterprise. That's my mom. Mm. And, you know, I love her, so, you know, and I miss her. And, um, you know, I hope she'd be okay. I feel very honored. I mean, he has life, or two life sentences, and he didn't think about himself. He thought about his mother. Constance Bootsy Perry is the unlikely matriarch of Washington's most prominent crime family. Before she got locked up, 
she had a $40,000 a year job in the federal government. So you, you got your kids educated, you made sure they went to church, you had a good job, your ex-husband had a good yeah, job? Yeah, he had a job. He worked for the government, too. He worked for the government. You were middle-class people. Yes. He was not raised in the inner city. He no, lived no. in the suburbs. No. Safe place. Yes. How many of your children are in jail? Six. You had seven kids and six are in jail. Yes. You're in jail? Yes. Come on. What happened? I can't really say, and I think basically I'm in here only because I knew what was going on. She was a mom to me. But also, she was a personal friend to me, so when things, you know, selling drugs, like I told you before, so many things go wrong. People get killed, people lose their jobs, people get strung out, and whenever things go wrong or things don't go right in my life, she was my friend. I go talk to her and tell her about all these things, about what's going on with me, and she knew about all that, and she ended up telling all the things that I told her to an informant on a wiretap, and, and that made her be part of the conspiracy. Well, it was more than that. Bootsy admits she once counted her son's drug money, and she accepted a car, a house, and other gifts purchased with his drug proceeds. My mother always wanted a nice big house, you know, so I wanted to be able to buy that for her one day. She always wanted a Mercedes. I wanted to be able to buy that for her. When Edmund was a child, both his parents sold drugs. The father allegedly heroin. Bootsy says she sold diet pills and admits she sometimes had Rafel handle the money. But she blames his friends for getting him into the drug trade. He saw the fast money, or he saw them driving big cars, and he, they, he said, hey, man, how did you do this? How did you get this? Yeah. The money. Yeah, the money. Or greed. Just say greed. I'd say greed. This is your watch. Yeah, it used to be my watch. used to be your watch. Yeah, the government watch. now has this watch. Yeah, the government owns it now. How much did this watch cost? Oh, uh, close to 100000 Was this typical of what you would buy yeah, when you were... typical things that I would buy when I was home. Well, you were fancy. Yeah, I was, I was a little jazzy. Yeah, I like, I like, you know, try to have a lot of class. Did you wear a lot of diamonds on your No, I wasn't, I wasn't, I just had one carat. I just had a 10 carat diamond ring. Oh. A three carat for my ear and just a, a diamond chain and master watch. Very simple. Yeah, just, you know, simple, but stand out. Today, he's trying not to stand out. So the feds have put him in a little known witness protection program for convicts. He lives under an alias in a different prison, where it's hoped those he betrayed won't find him. But if he's hiding out, why is he talking to us? He says he wants the kids in Washington, D.C., who see him as a hero, to know that what he did was wrong. A lot of my friends from my neighborhood lost their lives because I brought drugs in the community. You know, the crack people babies. dying. Crack yes, babies? Some babies probably was going from crack because of me. Yeah, I feel bad about the name, but back then, you know, I was, I was just thinking about the power. We tried to ask the Bureau of Prisons what they're doing to prevent prison drug dealing, but they refused to comment. So we asked their new boss, Eric Holder, who has not yet had a role in making prison policy. As a result of the RAFL incident, uh, a task force was created to really look uh, at the whole system and decide what we could be doing. It's been two years since you first found out about this. Not you, I mean the Bureau of Prisons, sure. the government, the Justice Department. It's been two years, and from what I'm hearing, the problem really has not been fixed yet. I think that's right. You're saying that it's remotely possible that as we're sitting here, somebody in some prison's making a phone call and setting up a drug deal somewhere. Yeah, I think that's remotely possible, but I think we're also going to be in a position real soon to say it's not possible. Do you think that's going on today, right now? I'm quite sure it is, yeah. People are sitting in prison making drug deals, yeah. And they, you know, you're sitting there, you have nothing to do. And everybody needs money, and they love money, so I'm quite sure that it's going on right now. In fact, the Bureau of Prisons may have made it even easier. When the FBI began its investigation of Rafael Edmond, there were three phones on his cell block, and inmates could use them every other day. Today, there are four phones, and prisoners can use them every day. Let me say this about Ray, man. That story that they, he pumped out there about he only did it because to save his mother, that's, that was some bullshit, man. Ray got weak. Rayful Edmund III, remember that name, was sentenced to life in prison, but a district court just filed a motion to reduce that sentence. Want to know why? John Henry will tell you. To understand why this is such big news, you first have to know the major impact Rayful Edmund had on D.C. 30 years ago. 
Manhattan in the late 1980s and early 90s. It was a lawless combat zone. Back then, the district was murder capital of the country. An automatic gunfire rang out. And the crack cocaine epidemic helped fuel it. People lining up two to three deep around the block to buy drugs. At the center of it all, Rayful Edmond. Edmond ran the biggest crack and cocaine distribution ring in D.C. history. I seen somebody at that time that was bigger than life. At one point, he made up to $60,000 a day. That is, until he got caught. Edmond is serving a mandatory life term. And yet, behind bars, he still broke the law. There have been abuses of privileges that these inmates were given. The operation from prison rivaled the scope of the organization Edmond once ran from his northeast neighborhood. Now Edmund got an additional 30 years for his crimes in prison. So why did the feds now think he should be released early? Well, apparently he talked a lot. For 20 years, the DC United States attorney said his cooperation had been both deep and wide. He discussed cold case murders, participated in reverse undercover drug sting operations. It ultimately all led the attorney's office to ask a judge to consider reducing the 54 year old's life sentence for his DC crimes to an unspecified term. Now it's up to a judge to see if that should happen. Well, today, the last of four community hearings took place to help a federal court judge decide whether or not convicted drug kingpin Rafael Edmond should be released from prison early. As Inez de la Quatera reports, those who attended today's hearing were divided over what should happen next. The name of notorious cocaine dealer Rafael Edmond is often enough to get a strong reaction from any Washingtonian. He was a part of an organized crime family. They murdered and slaughtered people. They decimated this city. The federal government has asked a judge to resentence Edmund after he cooperated with investigators, which has reportedly resulted in the arrests of dozens of other drug dealers. Today, D.C.'s Attorney General asked Washingtonians to answer two questions. Do you believe the court should grant the United States motion and reduce the sentence of Rafael Edmond? And if Mr. Edmond's sentence is reduced and he is ultimately released, would you support his returning to the district? Edmond should not only not receive an early release, he should not be allowed near any young people. Telling on somebody, telling somebody that somebody did something to save your own butt is not rehabilitation. Thank <laughs> you.